Hello, everybody, and welcome again to another OpenShift Commons briefing. Um, today, we've got uh, Martin Edmar from um, Dynatrace, and he's going to talk about monitoring microservices at scale on OpenShift. We're really happy to have him with us. We've had a few technical bugs, but other than that, um, we're going to get moving, and I'll let uh, Martin um, talk, introduce himself a little bit more. And the format of this is that uh, you can ask questions in the chat while we're going through this, and then there's Q&A afterwards, and there's a few people on from Dynatrace who may be able to answer questions in chat, but if there's really good questions, we may pause him um, and make him take a breath again, or just save them and reiterate them in the Q&A. And um, we will run over your, the allotted time a little bit today because we had a late start, but um, we'll be happy to, to do, do so. So go for it, Martin. Um, introduce yourself and show us what you can do Good Thank you very much, Diane, for having me, and welcome everybody to this presentation. So my name is Martin Edmeyer, and I am a technology lead at the Dynatrace Innovation Lab. If you happen to have any questions regarding our deep integration with OpenShift or on our Reddit partnership in general, please do not hesitate to reach out directly to me. So who is Dynatrace? Dynatrace is the leading digital performance management solution. Um, by making business development and operations succeed in optimizing customer experience, modernizing their operations, and accelerating innovation. At Dynatrace, we are proud partners with Red Hat, and it is our mission to create the best performance management solution around OpenShift, OpenStack, and Ansible. And in this presentation, I want to demonstrate that we are serious about this. So let me start with a quick introduction to why microservices. When we talk about microservices, we talk about dozens to hundreds, if not thousands, of small interconnected components that each serve a single purpose. The reason why microservices are so appealing is that they have the potential to solve a variety of problems enterprises are seeing these days. Microservices increase velocity by enabling independent development and deployment of code. And as Rich Sharps, the Senior Director of Product at Red Hat, mentioned at the Reddit Summit in 2016, today speed equals revenue. Microservices also support growth by allowing services to be scaled independently. So depending on the traffic scenario, we can add a few instances here or remove a few instances there. Also, microservices foster innovation. They enable experimentation and fail fast to create the right products. And they do so by enforcing agile, product-centered, and self-enabled teams. Now, these features make microservices look good on paper. But what do they look like in production? So this screenshot has been taken from one of South America's largest e-commerce production environments, serving more than 3,000 services, as you can see on the left, distributed over more than 10,000 containers in seven data centers. So building a system composed of microservices effectively means building a fault-tolerant, highly dynamic distributed system. And that is really a complex thing to do. Let's take a look at an important detail here. As you can see from those red colored nodes, which are uh, faulty services, you can see on the left that a total number of 30, of 30 services have failed in the entire service landscape. But most importantly, and this is what Dynatrace understands like no other tool, is that none of these faulty services had any impact on the customer's nine applications, right? So if you have a distributed, fault-tolerant, uh, highly dynamic system, you do not want to be alerted for each single CPU spike or any problem that you see unless it affects your users. So now I would like to present how Dynatrace can help you manage the complexities when designing and running microservices on OpenShift by discussing three important learnings that we've made along the way. 
So learning number one is that microservices are complex. In fact, microservices, they can themselves be fairly simple on the inside. However, the overall complexity does not vanish. Instead, complexity shifts into the surrounding environment and the intercommunication between services. We also say that microservices have a lower inner versus a higher outer complexity in the connected parts. So let's talk about environmental complexity first. So what is a microservice platform composed of? We need things like service discovery, configuration management, routing, load balancing, execution environments like Docker, messaging channels, but also things like deployment automation and monitoring are considered key capabilities of a microservices platform. And if you're using OpenShift, the complexity of building and running such an architecture are nicely abstracted by convenient tooling. But still, you're going to build, ship, and run your services on a significantly complex distributed software stack. And essentially, you use a pass because there's no real sense in crafting your own platform. And in a clustered environment, you also don't really care about how your containers are scheduled but that doesn't mean that you should fly blind. So drilling down here to see some more detail shows the Dynatrace computes a topology model of the entire system which reflects the real-time relations and dynamics of your application right down to the data center that they run in, including any services, processes, or Docker containers which we used interchangeably in, in this view uh, and hosts. Now, this is important for two reasons. So number one is that customers have told us that they had no idea what their system actually looked like until we showed them. And reason number two is that having the possibility to introspect a system at its various layers in detail and in real time helps people in business that an operations make better decisions, and this is what Dynatrace is about. And I want to add that all of this information that you see here is also discovered for you. You don't have to do anything. It's kind of zero configuration, out of the box. So let me talk about inter-service complexity now. One design principle of microservices is to do one thing and do one thing well which aids separation of concerns and improves composability. Now, to remain composable, microservices demand robust APIs. Now, imagine the desired scenario where your teams own separate microservices. How can you be sure that the resulting services interact as designed? Of course, with Dynatrace, we cannot validate that your services behave as intended by their designers. But we make you see how your services are composed and how often and in which ways they interact in real time. So what you see here on this screen is what we call the service flow. And you see that we have multiple services connected to each other, right? It's not a simple system. We have a backend service, we have bookend services, journey services, and we see how often and in which ways those services interact and how those service calls contribute to the overall response time. Now, here's another way to look at the same service. Now, we see on the left side, in the main part of the screen, we see the, the median response time. We see the failure rate of that service. We also see how many services invoke the service, so the fan-in. You also see how many services are getting invoked by the services, in this case, 11 services. We also see that this service is not a single process. It's actually running on four different Tomcat instances. And we also see that the service communicates with two queues asynchronously to communicate with other services. And if you click on any of these buttons here in the UI. 
you'll get further information on what these interactions look like on behalf of this very service. What we also see on the right side is that we have, and this is something that would affect the composability, so how well your services can be composed, uh, that we have a certain REST endpoint that has a 100% failure rate. So certainly there is a bad implementation happening here, right? We also see which are the most time-consuming requests. Time-consuming requests are not only slow requests, but are also called um, a large number of times, right? So they contribute considerably to the overall response time uh, of this service. And then we also see the generally slowest requests on that service. So those are your candidates for uh, improvements, right? And if you take another look on the left side, what you see here on this time series chart is, as I selected here, the response time, okay? So we also see that the response time uh, had a problem. We had a response time degradation. Um, we had various events over, over that time frame, right? And we can also drill down into the problem and take a look at the problem details. And I wanna do this a little later on during this presentation. Now, I talked a little bit about the inter-service complexity. What about the intra-service complexity, the things that go on inside the service that, that we have to talk about? So, um, as an example here, uh, a new stack article mentioned that synchronous REST communication effectively turns microservices back into monolith. So when you read about performance in microservices, many companies, many enterprises, they, they actually understood that there's no way around asynchronous communication, right? Because there's so much communication going on over the network, which is considerably slower than communicating um, in, in memory as we used to in monolithic applications. Um, synchronous communication is just not the way to go. And enforcing asynchronous communication uh, and queues and decentralized data management um, bring another level of complexity, um, eventual consistency, and other things like that, which make your systems really hard to handle and oversee. Another thing that I'd like to mention, it's also complexity that happens inside your microservices, is that your threading model and the way that you interact, that your service interacts with other services uh, dramatically affects the efficiency and the resource consumption of your services. So what can you do in Dynatrace? So here is um, what we call at the screen the response time analysis of a service. And here you see at a glance how, or how, how the response time is distributed uh, in terms of interaction with other services and queues, uh, database usage, um, but also service execution, which means the code executed um, for this particular service at hand, right? And there's lots of things that you can drill down into here. But what I'd like to show you is that on the very bottom, you see what we call the pure path. So here you can see the actual method invocations which take place inside the service. And let me repeat again, you don't, all this is done automatically for you. You don't have to do this by hand, right? This is why we've built Dynatrace, and this is the level of convenience that we wanted to create for uh, large-scale distributed microservice environments. So the learning number two is that microservices don't fail independently. In a highly distributed microservices environment, the old saying, the more moving parts, the higher the likelihood for failure certainly holds true. And since failures can happen any time, you have to become fault tolerant. That is, you have to ensure that your application can tolerate a potentially high number of simultaneous failures without compromising customer experience. And just because microservices can be deployed independently, that is, if designed correctly, it doesn't mean that they fail independently. So more often than not, they fail in a cascade. 
And what you see here is a feature in Dynatrace that allows you to analyze the failure um, or the problem, as we call it, of your services. And if you look on the right, uh, this is actually an animation that you can start, which begins right before the problem occurred and then shows you how the problem evolved and how it eventually disappear, disappeared over time. Because most problems that we deal with in production are of transient nature. Think of a CPU spike, right? Um, the important thing is that you can replay and see how did uh, this particular problem affect my service and then how did it populate and bubble up to the user and did it affect my user at all or didn't? Didn't it affect my user at all, right? So um, this is a very helpful feature and gives a lot of insight into what's actually happening inside a problem. And I would like to add that we correlate a singular instance in, uh, incident that happened in your system and we understand the dynamics of those systems and we see we, we can automatically deduce whether they belong to the same problem or not. So instead of um, alerting you during the night and saying that the CPU spiked or that Tomcat crashed, we give you the replay functionality so that you can look at it uh, as a single problem and you don't have to look at all these uncorrelated incidents that you usually find uh, in log messaging based solutions. So let's assume now that your application has failed. The questions that you would like to have answered immediately are, what's affected, what's the impact, and what's the root cause? And at Dynatrace, we have more than 10 years of experience in building uh, performance monitoring solutions. And that's why we give you this information at a glance. So this is the analysis of a particular problem. And we see at the first sight what's affected. We have three applications which have been affected in a given time frame. You see the time frame here. We also see immediately that the problem affected or affects real users. If we look at the table below, we see that the problem has already recovered and that it affected three applications, 15 services, and two infrastructure components. Right? So it's actually good to know that the problem has already recovered or that the applications and services and infrastructure components have recovered. But let's take a look at what, what was the impact. So we already know that three applications have been impacted. And in total, around 1,500 user actions have been impacted per minute. So this has been uh, a user visible problem, right? We also see, if we look further down, that one of the applications had a slowdown uh, to 2.5 uh, minutes uh, as a median value. And we also see that all browsers, all user actions have been affected on all operating systems across all geolocations. Now, the nice thing about this view is if the problem had only existed in an area around Boston or in an area around Vancouver, we would have told you so here, right? And we also let you know what's the root cause. And in this case, we've analyzed more than 90 million dependencies for, to, for this problem and analyzed that the root cause has been a CPU situa saturation on these two nodes with the given name, right? And I want, to take, I want to take a step back here and go back to the number of the 90 million dependencies which we analyzed here. So 90 million dependencies, where does this large number come from? So when you install Dynatrace um, for OpenShift, we automatically detect how your processes communicate. We automatically detect how the services communicate. We automatically baseline the metrics like response time. And, and many other things, right? So those are dependencies which we analyze so that we, in the end, can come up with a clear image of what has been affected in your application and, and whether it affected your users or not. Okay, 
so learning number two, learning number three is the network isn't reliable. Well, let's quickly talk about the role of the network. So when you migrate from a monolithic to a microservices-oriented architecture, you trade fast in-memory communication to much slower inter-service communication across networks. And let's take a look at the service flow again. If you look at those two uh, services, the journey service and the check destination service. So if you want to validate whether what we've done here actually makes sense. So you can see that the journey service for 99% of its invocations, for the 99% the journey service is called, invokes the check destination service. So that's about one time per request, right? So if, if communicating with services uh, contributes considerably to your response time, right? You might reconsider whether um, a high level of distribution of your microservices actually makes sense, or if you might want to re-migrate those services into a single service, right? So what if the network infrastructure itself becomes a limiting factor in your application? And those things indeed happen. So what you see here is from our, demo, from our demo application, but I recently had a discussion with a CTO of a company in Europe uh, whose goal is no less than becoming the next generation eBay in Europe. And what their problem has been that they had a high number of TCP packet retransmissions, and they didn't know where it came from. And as a rule of thumb, if you have a highly networked application that's communicating um, widely across the network, then a, a TCP retransmission of 6% already renders your application almost unusable. Now, in this scenario, and also in the scenario that the CTO told me about, they had a, C a TCP retransmission percentage of around 10%. And they found out that it was due to a defect pin on one of their network cables. So how could you potentially figure out this problem uh, if you only look at your log messages? You, you possibly can't. And this is what we automatically detect for you. And this is why baselining and automated baselining is so crucial. Okay, so let me talk about how to Dynatrace. How can you, how can you get Dynatrace into OpenShift? So let me introduce you to Dynatrace One Agent. Dynatrace One Agent is our single agent technology that allows you to monitor your applications, your services, your processes, your Docker containers, your hosts, and the underlying infrastructure without any configuration, out of the box. And this is how it works. So basically, there are, there are two major options. And the option number one that I'm referring to here is the one that we, that we would say is the preferred option because it gives you the entire picture. And this is what we call, what we call Dynatrace One Agent for Full Stack Monitoring. So what you would do is you would roll out the one agent on the host machines that make up your OpenShift Kubernetes clusters. And once you've done that, you will get uh, insights into everything that runs on top of your machines including the OpenShift and Kubernetes infrastructure and all your containerized processes running on top of the platform. So we've also created an Ansible role, which is available on the Ansible Galaxy for the automated deployment of, um, of Dynatrace One Agent for full stack monitoring on your cluster nodes. So this is very convenient. Another option that you could choose and this also in, uh, includes the full stack monitoring approach is to run the Dynatrace One agent inside a Docker container. And we actually, in, in this scenario, one agent does not run in a Docker container, but we use a Docker container as a vehicle to roll out one agent on the nodes that, that make up your cluster through privileged access, right? So this is what it actually looks like. 
And uh, we're proud that since a few days, we're, uh, our Dynatrix One Agent uh, container has been Reddit container certified, which means that the container is secure and, uh, and trusted and is ready to use on OpenShift and on uh, atomic-based hosts. So this has been the preferred approach, and you can use it on any OpenShift platform where you have direct access to the host level. But what happens if you use OpenShift uh, in a managed scenario like OpenShift Dedicated or OpenShift Online Developer Preview, right? What can you do? So what we did is we provide Dynatrix One Agent for pass monitoring. So if you don't have access to the node level, it's not a blocker. What you can do is you can use Dynatrix One Agent for pass and conveniently include it into each of your Docker containers that you would like to have monitored by Dynatrace. And the way that you can do this is by using either the OpenShift command line interface. You can also use the, the Nifty S2I or a source to image tool that's also provided by Red Hat. But you can also fall back to uh, traditional Docker files if that's what you like to do, right? And if you're interested in doing so, there are lots of tutorials which we provide on the OpenShift blog. Right? So what this gives you is that you can use Dynatrace with OpenShift on any OpenShift platform and for any OpenShift offering, whether that's OpenShift Origin or um, OpenShift Container Platform, as it's called now, OpenShift Dedicated or OpenShift Online. And if you're interested in learning how you can roll out one agent, either for full stack monitoring or for your Docker containers, please take a look at the blog articles the Dynatrix team has provided uh, on blogs.openshift.com. You can also refer to our landing page. You can simply find us by searching for OpenShift monitoring on Google and then uh, directly follow to our landing page. And once you're there, please check out the Dynatrace free trial and please provide feedback. Martin, there's a, there's a number of I, questions. Before I, yeah. Okay, so there are a number of questions that are coming in, probably more on the technical side of how all this works. Um, sure. Do you want to pause? And um, uh, the first one um, kind of answered it a little bit. Um, from a technical perspective, how does this all work? Um, is there an agent that runs in each container? And how does it trace a call through many containers? And does it add header information to all the packets? Number of questions in one. And then another one that's coming up. Okay, can you up repeat is, the last question, please? And how does it talk how, about headers, how, about headers? Does it add header information to all the packets? Oh. Okay. All right. So um, how does it work to, to inject Dynatrix one agent into containers? So Basically, we've um, divided the installation of one agent for a path in, into three simple steps, right? So the first step is to download one agent for a path uh, from, from, from Dynatrace, and this will uh, install Dynatrace one agent inside your container. So this can be a container that you create using source to image. It can also be a container that you create using uh, the OC command line interface. You can also use this approach to inject uh, the Dynatrace One agent for a pass into existing applications that already run on OpenShift by leveraging uh, OC patch or OC edit, right? And, and the approach is basically that you install the agent into each of your containers. So once the installation has been done, for Java, this is very simple. It's a simple com single command uh, that takes approximately 20 megabytes of space in your container. And then we provide additional convenience on top, of that, on top of that, because the one agent for pass has to be injected into your particular application process. In terms of Java, Java, this would be a JVM. But to make your life convenient is you just have to source a configuration file that already provides uh, the necessary Java options so that when the Java virtual machine is started, automatically picks up the agent. And that's step number two. Step number three for you would be to start your Java application, and that's it, right? 
So in order, so what you will get when using the pass approach is that you will get um, all the information. You can't, you cannot obviously get any information from the hosts that you know are the foundation of your OpenShift cluster, but you can get all the information of your processes, of your services, and of your applications, including uh, real user management. Right. So, and the other technical question regarding header is that when you use Steinitch's one agent and a web server for real user management, for example, then it would add, add header information so that we can keep track of your entire transaction from the web browser or your mobile client across all the backend tiers and backend services that are running on, on OpenShift. Okay, I hope this answered the question. If not, uh, please feel free to reach out to me directly. I will, uh, in a minute, uh, show the uh, email address uh, again. Um, one last question here about um, what, what overhead can be expected if we deploy the agent inside the workload containers. Yeah, so from, it uh, depends on what you mean with overhead, but if you, if you talk about, uh, let's start with uh, hard disk space. So this really depends on the technology. So let's say for Java, the, the agent uh, costs you no more than 20 megabytes of space inside your containers, and I think that's a pretty fair amount of space. So if you think in terms of performance, um, we've taken um, a lot of caution because we know that we integrate deeply into your application. And for example, Java, depending on how deeply you instrument your application, but we take around 1% to 2% of the performance of your application. And, and we believe that for the amount of information that we give for you out of the box, this is also a pretty, pretty fair amount. Cool. All right, I think that answer to this question. Um, we're saying thanks. Uh, why don't you put up that last um, slide that you had um, with your email address if there are more questions? That should... Yes, I want to do that. I just want to quickly present a quick outlook. What, uh, what's coming up next? Um, sure. There's a lot of things uh, coming down the pipe, and we want to integrate more deeply with the OpenShift platform. But what I would like to tell you about is that we would like to um, have Dynatrace inside continuous delivery, as we call it, also work on OpenShift. So uh, if you look at the, the ecosystem around OpenShift and, uh, OpenShift and the work that has been done by the developer experience team uh, of OpenShift, um, so what, what they have is they have set up a continuous delivery uh, project that you can quickly spin up by just using an OpenShift template, right, or Kubernetes, Kubernetes template. So what Dynatrace has been doing for, for many years in the past is that we have helped customers understand whether their applications are good enough to be pushed into production or not. So by analyzing their automated tests, meaning integration tests, and acceptance tests, whether they use, uh, whether they test REST APIs or whether they test uh, the user interface, browser, user, uh, browser UI, web UI. It's um, that we can understand um, whether this would have any severe performance implications or not, right? So we call this an architectural validation before you go into production. So what we say is, I want to keep it short now because we're already over time is don't just optimize for speed. We all talk about speed, right? But it's, it's also about quality. So instead, release fast and with certainty. And we want to provide you with a use case where you can uh, use Dynatrace not only in production, but also in pre-production to understand whether your containers that you have in OpenShift are fit for purpose in production or not, okay? So in detail, this means that we can help you identify bad code before it gets checked in. We collect performance metrics from automated tests, and we feed back those metrics into Jenkins and are able to auto stop bad builds if you want us to do so. But that's an optional thing, right? But this is what we're able to do. So if there's only one thing that you take away from, from this OpenShift Commons briefing, I would like you to be at the, the AAA, as we call it. This means that Dynatrace provides discovery out of the box. It comes with auto baselining of all the important metrics that we determine from your processes, from your containers, from your services and your applications. And it also comes with automatic problem 
analysis. That means that you don't have to manually correlate thousands and millions of incidents. We understand how these incidents relate to each other and serve them to you conveniently as single problems that you can replay and understand how they evolved and how they actually vanished over time if they've been transient. Okay? So please, if you have any further questions, try out the free trial, give us feedback, and let us know how we can further improve and help you succeed uh, in your journey. Thank Martin. you very much. Martin, there, there's one more question that just came in. John, um, it's sort of a follow-up on that header one we had earlier. And um, how do you ensure the header information persists through various microservices? And he gives an example. The example is, if a REST call goes to, a ser to service A, two seconds later a REST call goes to service B, how do you know they're related? Yeah, I'm not sure if I can give an adequate question because that goes deeply into how we, uh, how we implement the agent. But if, John, if you send me an email, uh, I will uh, send you an, um, an appropriate answer and can also uh, bring you in contact with a development team member who, who knows really uh, how this has been done. Right. So please do reach out, um, and if you, if you can't get directly to him, just post it, uh, the question on the mailing list for OpenShift Commons, which most of you should be on. If you're not, um, sign up soon. It's on commons.openshift.org, and you can just join and we'll add you to the main mailing list. Again, thanks, Martin. Um, thanks for suffering through the technical sound check, and we're really pleased to have you here. <laughs> We'll definitely do this again um, in probably in, in 2017 because I, I do I would love to see this running on um, I have a couple of uh, large scale um, folks that are using that could use this and I'd love to see that some of the work working through that and 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 just sweet see it live and in action though I do realize that it, it is a in the in interest in time it's probably um, very hard to demo that live, um, but it could be, it would be an interesting thing to see. Um, so once again, thank you. Um, and folks, if you have questions for Martin or um, about Dynatrace, just reach out directly to them. Um, and we'll be doing this again next week. Um, and hopefully you'll join us all for the OpenShift Commons gathering in Seattle. And Martin, our, I think there's a couple folks from Dynatrace who are coming to that that have registered. So oh, yes, we'll be there. All right, um, you can ask them in person in Seattle on November 7th at the OpenShift Gathering. So take care, everybody, and we'll talk to you all soon.